of their salvations. We now arrive at the time when you as jurors are to perform your final function in this case. At the outset, let me express my thanks and appreciation to you for your attention to this case. I'd like to commend counsel for the professional manner in which they presented their respective cases, for the courtesy of the court and jury during the course of this trial. Now, before you retire to deliberate and reach your verdict, it's my obligation to instruct you as principles of law applicable to this case. You shall consider my instructions in their entirety and not pick out any particular instruction and overemphasize it. Generally speaking, these instructions consist of four parts. The first part deals with the general principles of law that apply to a criminal case. The second part describes the evidence that you may consider in your deliberations. The third part is about the portions of the criminal code of New Jersey that you must apply to the facts as you find them to be in this case to determine whether the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant violated a specific criminal statute. Finally, the fourth part of the instructions tells you how to go about conducting your deliberations. You must accept and apply this law for this case as I give it to you in this charge. Any ideas you have of what the law is, what the law should be, or any statements by the attorneys as to what the law may be must be disregarded by you if they are in conflict with my charge. So now beginning with the general principles of law that apply to, to a criminal case. The defendant stands before you on an indictment returned by the grand jury charging him with count one, obstruction of the administration of law, and count two, contempt in violating a domestic violence order by a crime or disorder person's offense. The indictment is not evidence of the defendant's guilt on the charges. The indictment is a step in the procedure to bring the matter before the court and jury for the jury's ultimate determination as to whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the charges stated in it. The defendant is pleaded not guilty to the charges. The defendant on trial is presumed to be innocent, and unless each and every essential element of the offense charge is proved beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant must be found not guilty of that charge. The burden of proving each element of a charge beyond a reasonable doubt rests upon the state, and that burden never shifts to the defendant. The defendant in a criminal case has no obligation or duty to prove his innocence or offer any proof related to his innocence. The prosecution must prove its case by more than a mere preponderance of the evidence, yet not necessarily with absolute certainty. The state has the burden of proving the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I know some of this is redundant, but it's part of the charge. I mean, we've said it before. Some of you may have served as jurors in civil cases where you were told that it's necessary to prove that a fact is more likely true than not true. In criminal cases, the state's proof must be more powerful than that. It must be beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is an honest and reasonable uncertainty in your minds about the guilt of the defendant after you've given full and impartial consideration to all of the evidence. A reasonable doubt may arise from the evidence itself or from a lack of evidence. It is a doubt that a reasonable person hearing the same evidence would have. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof, for example, that leaves you firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt. Now, in this world, we know very few things with absolute certainty. In criminal cases, the law doesn't require proof that overcomes every possible doubt. If, based on your consideration of the evidence, you're firmly convinced that the defendant's guilty of the crime charged, you must find him guilty. If, on the other hand, you are not firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt, you must give the defendant the, defendant the benefit of the doubt and find him not guilty. Now, the function of the judge is separate and distinct from the function of the jury. It's my responsibility to determine all questions of the law arising during trial and to instruct the jury as to the law which applies in this case. You must accept the law as given to you by me and apply it to the facts that you find them to be. During the course of the trial, I was required to make certain rulings on the admissibility of the evidence either in or outside of the presence. These rulings involve questions of law. The comments of the attorneys on these matters were not evidence. In ruling, I've decided questions of law, and whatever the ruling may have been in any particular instance, you should understand that it was not an expression of my opinion about the merits of the case. Neither should my other rulings have any, uh, on any other aspect of the trial be taken as favoring one side or the other. Each matter was decided on its own merits. I may have sustained objections to some questions asked by counsel, which may have contained statements of certain facts. The mere fact that an attorney asks a question and inserts facts or comments or opinions in that question 
in no way proves the existence of those facts. You will only consider such facts which, in your judgment, have been proven by the testimony of witnesses or from exhibits admitted into evidence by the court. The fact that I may have asked questions of witnesses in this case must not influence you in any way in your deliberations. The fact that I ask such questions does not indicate that I hold any opinion one way or the other as to the testimony given by the witnesses. Any remarks made by me to counsel, or by counsel to me, or between counsel, are not evidence and should not affect or play any part in your deliberations. And as I instructed you when we started the case, I explained to you that you are the judges of the facts. And as judges of the facts, you are to determine the credibility of the various witnesses as well as the weight to be attached to their testimony. You and you alone are the sole and exclusive judges of the evidence, of the credibility of the witnesses, and the weight to be attached to the testimony of each witness. Regardless of what counsel said or what I may have said recalling evidence in this case, it's your recollection of the evidence that should guide you as judges of the facts. Arguments, statements, remarks, openings, and submissions of counsel are not evidence and must not be treated as evidence. Although the attorneys may point out what they think is important in this case, you must rely solely upon your understanding and recollection of the evidence that was admitted during the trial. Whether or not the defendant has been proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt is for you to determine based on all the evidence presented during the trial. Any comments by counsel are not controlled. It's your sworn duty to arrive at a just conclusion after considering all the evidence which was presented during the course of the trial. Now I'll move on to the second part of the instructions and discuss the evidence that you may consider in judging the facts of the case. When I use the term evidence, I mean the testimony that you've heard from the witness box, any stipulations and exhibits that have been admitted into evidence. Any exhibit that has not been admitted into evidence cannot be given to you in the jury room, even though it may have been marked for identification. Only those items admitted into evidence can be given to you. Any testimony that I may have had occasion to strike is not evidence and shall not enter, your, enter into your final deliberations. It must be disregarded by you. This means that even though you may remember the testimony, you're not to use it in your discussion during deliberations. <clears throat> Further, if I gave a limiting instruction as to how to use certain evidence, that evidence must be considered by you for that purpose only. You cannot use it for any other purpose. As jurors, it is your duty to weigh the evidence calmly and without passion, prejudice, or sympathy. Any influence caused by these emotions has the potential to deprive both the state and the defendant of what you promised them, a fair and impartial trial by fair and impartial jurors. Also, speculation, conjecture, or other forms of guessing play no role in the performance of your duties. Now, as I instructed you at the beginning of the case, evidence may be either direct or circumstantial. Direct <coughs> evidence means evidence that directly proves a fact without an inference, and which in itself, if true, conclusively establishes the fact. On the other hand, circumstantial evidence means evidence that proves a fact from, for, from which an inference of the existence of another fact may be drawn. An inference is a deduction of fact that may logically and reasonably be drawn from, from another fact or group of facts established by the evidence. Whether or not the inferences should be drawn is for you to decide, using your own common sense, knowledge, and everyday experience. Ask yourselves, is it probable, logical, and reasonable? It's not necessary that all the facts be proven by direct evidence. They may be proven by direct evidence, circumstantial evidence, or by a combination of the two. All are acceptable as a means of proof. In many cases, circumstantial, circumstantial evidence may be more certain, satisfying, and persuasive than direct evidence. However, direct and circumstantial evidence should be scrutinized and evaluated carefully. A verdict of guilty may be based on direct evidence alone, circumstantial evidence alone, or a combination of the two. Provided, of course, that it convinces you of a defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The reverse is also true. A defendant may be found not guilty by reason of direct evidence, circumstantial evidence, the combination of the two, or a lack of evidence if it raises in your mind a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt. Now, as judges of the facts, you are to determine the credibility of the witnesses. And in determining whether a witness is worthy of belief, and therefore credible, 
you may take into consideration the following. The appearance and demeanor of the witness, the manner in which he or she may have testified, the witness's interest in the outcome of the trial, if any, his or her means of obtaining knowledge of the facts, the witness's power of discernment, meaning his or her judgment, understanding, his or her ability to reason, observe, re recollect, and relate, the possible bias, if any, in favor of the side for whom the witness testified, the extent to which, if at all, each witness is either corroborated or contradicted, supported, it, supported or discredited by other evidence, whether the witness testified with an intent to deceive you, the reasonableness or unreasonableness of the testimony the witness is given, whether the witness made any inconsistent or contradictory statements, and any and all other matters in the evidence which serve to support or discredit his or her testimony. Through this analysis, as judges of the facts, you weigh the testimony of each witness and then determine the weight to give it. Through that process, you may accept all of it, a portion of it, or none of it. If you believe that any witness or party willfully or knowingly testified falsely to any material facts in the case with an intent to deceive you, you may give such weight to his or her testimony as you deem it entitled. Deem it as entitled. You may believe some of it, or you may, in your discretion, disregard all of it. Now I will instruct you on the third part of the instructions on the portions of the criminal code that you must apply to the facts you find to determine whether the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant violated a specific criminal statute. The statute, read together with the indictment, identifies the elements which the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt to establish the guilt of the defendant on each of the counts in the indictment. Now the law requires the court to instruct the jury with respect to possible lesser included offenses even if they're not contained in the indictment. Just because the court is instructing you concerning those offenses does not mean that the court has any opinion, one way or the other, about whether the defendant committed these or any offenses. You should consider these offenses along with those for which the defendant is indicted. However, you are not to render a verdict on these offenses or answer the questions on the verdict sheet unless you find that the, fate, the state has failed to meet its burden with respect with regard to the offenses in the indictment. And you can jury uh, the verdict sheet to understand that. Better. All right. There are two offenses charged in the indictment. They are separate offenses by separate counts in the indictment. In your determination of whether the state has proven the defendant guilty of the crimes charged in the indictment beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant is entitled to have each count considered separately by the evidence which is relevant and material to that particular charge based on the law as I will give it to you. Those are just some interns looking at the points coming into the court. Count one of the indictment charges the defendant with obstructing, with obstructing the administration of law or other governmental function. That section of our statutes provides that a person commits an offense if he purposely obstructs, impairs, or perverts the administration of law or other governmental function, or prevents or attempts to prevent a public servant from lawfully performing an official function by means of an independently unlawful act. In order to find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, that the defendant committed an unlawful act. Two, that the act was committed for the purpose of A, obstructing, impairing, or perverting the administration of law or other governmental function, or B, preventing a public servant from lawfully performing an official function, and that in committing the act, the defendant did or attempted to obstruct, impair, or pervert the administration of law or other governmental function, or B, prevent a public servant from lawfully performing an official function. The first element that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that the defendant committed an unlawful act. In other words, an act that is, without regard to its purpose to obstruct justice, already declared illegal. In this case, the state alleges that the defendant committed the unlawful act of failing to surrender his firearms as required by the temporary restraining order. You cannot find, you cannot find the defendant guilty of obstruction, obstructing the administration of law or other governmental function unless you find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt 
of having committed this unlawful act, this arraignment with the firearms. The second element that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that the defendant committed the unlawful act for the purpose of obstructing, impairing, or perverting the administration of law or other than governmental function, or preventing a public servant from lawfully performing an official function. A person acts purposely with respect to the nature of his conduct or a result thereof. If it is his conscious object to engage in conduct of that nature or to cause such a result, a person acts purposely with respect to attendant circumstances if he's aware of the existence of such circumstances or he believes or hopes that they exist. Purpose is a condition of the mind that cannot be seen and that can be determined only by inferences from conduct, words, or acts. A state of mind is rarely susceptible of direct proof, but ordinarily, but must ordinarily be inferred from the facts. Therefore, it's not necessary that the state produce witnesses to testify that an accused said that he had a certain state of mind when he engaged in a particular act. It's within your power to find that such proof has been furnished beyond a reasonable doubt by inference, which may arise from the nature of the defendant's acts of conduct, from all that he said and did at a particular time and place, and from all the surrounding circumstances. The third element that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that in committing the act, the defendant did or attempted to obstruct, impair, or pervert the administration of law or the other governmental function of securing firearms pursuant to the temporary restraint order, or that he prevented a public servant from lawfully performing an official function. A public servant means any officer or employee of government. In this case, the state alleges that the defendant prevented or attempted to prevent a law enforcement officer from lawfully performing the official function of securing firearms pursuant to the temporary restraint order. If the state has failed to prove any element of this offense beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant not guilty. If the state has proven each element of this offense beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant guilty. Count two. Under count two of the indictment, the defendant, Herbert Reed, is charged with the crime of violating a court order entered under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act. The New Jersey statutes on this count describe this crime as follows. A person guilty of a crime, if that person purposely or knowingly violates a provision in an order entered under the provisions of the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act, when the conduct which constitutes the violation could also constitute a crime or disorderly person's offense. In order for the defendant to be found guilty of this crime, the state has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt the following four elements. One, that there was a court order entered under the provisions of the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act. Two, that the defendant knew of the existence of the order. Three, that the defendant purposely or knowingly violated the provision of the order. And four, the conduct which constituted the violation could also constitute a crime or disorderly person's offense. The first element is that there was a court order entered under the provisions of the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act. The second element is that the defendant knew of the existence of the order. And I shall shortly define knowingly for you. The third element is that the defendant purposely or knowingly violated the provision of the order. A person acts purposely with respect to the nature of his conduct or the result thereof if it is his conscious object to engage in conduct of that nature or to cause such a result. A person acts purposely with respect to attendant circumstances if he is aware of the existence of such circumstances or he believes or hopes they exist. The terms with purpose, design, with design, or equivalent terms have the same meaning. Now, a person acts knowingly with respect to the nature of his conduct or the attendant circumstances if he is aware that his conduct is of that nature or that such circumstances exist or he's aware of a high probability of their existence. A person acts knowingly with respect to the result of his conduct if he's aware that it is practically certain that his conduct will cause such a result. Knowing with knowledge or equivalent terms have the same meaning. Now, it's alleged 
that Mr. Reed violated the mandate and the temporary restraining order with the uh, attached doc number FB03-387-19 to surrender his firearms by the following conduct, failing to surrender his weapons. In order for you to find the defendant guilty of the crime charged, you must find that the defendant's conduct could also constitute a crime of obstruction. I previously described uh, the fine uh, obstruction for you in the first count. If you find that the state has proven the first three elements beyond a reasonable doubt, that is, that there was a court order entered under the provisions of the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act, that the defendant knew of the existence of the order, and that he purposely or knowingly violated the provisions of the order as described, but you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the conduct which constitutes the violation could also constitute a separate crime or disorderly person's offense, then the defendant must be found guilty of a less serious offense, namely a disorderly person's offense of violating the court order under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act. Thus, you may return one of three possible verdicts on this particular charge. One, guilty of the crime of violating a court order entered under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act, which requires conduct that could constitute a separate crime or disorderly person's offense. Or two, guilty of the disorderly person's offense of violating a court order entered under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act, which does not require conduct that could also constitute a separate crime or disorderly person's offense. Or three, of course, not guilty. So to summarize, if you find the state has failed to prove each and every one of the first three elements beyond a reasonable doubt, namely that there was a court order entered under the provisions, provisions of the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act, that the defendant knew of the existence of the order, and that he purposely or knowingly violated the provision of the order, you must first find, you must find the defendant not guilty. If you find that the state has proven all of the first three elements beyond a reasonable doubt, but you are not satisfied, you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the conduct which constituted the violation could also constitute a separate crime or disorderly person's offense, you must find the defendant guilty of the disorderly person's offense of violating an order under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act. If you find that the state has proven all four elements beyond a reasonable doubt, including the element that the conduct which constituted the violation could also constitute a separate crime or disorderly person's offense, you must find the defendant guilty of the crime of violating an order under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act. Coming into the home stretch now, almost done. The final part of these instructions on conducting your deliberations. There's nothing different in the way a jury is to consider the proof in a criminal case from that in which all reasonable persons treat any questions depending upon evidence presented to them. You are expected to use your, good, your own good common sense. Consider the evidence for only those purposes for which it's been admitted and give it a reasonable and fair construction in the light of your knowledge of how people behave. It is the quality of the evidence, not simply the number of witnesses that control. As I said before, any exhibit that has not been marked to the evidence cannot be given to you in the jury room, even though it may have been marked for identification. Only those items marked in evidence can be given to you. Very shortly, you will go into the jury room to start your deliberations. I remind you that during deliberations, and in fact, any time, you're in the jury deliberation room. You must keep any cell phone, pager, or other communication device uh, you may possess turned off. You are to apply the law as I have instructed you, as I have instructed you, to the facts as you find them to be, for the purpose of arriving at a fair and correct verdict. The verdict must represent the considered judgment of each juror and must be unanimous as to each charge. This means all of you must agree if the defendant is guilty or not guilty on each charge. It's your duty as jurors to consult with one another and to deliberate with a few towards reaching an agreement if you can do so without violence to individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. With your fellow jurors. 
In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your own views and change your opinion if convinced it's erroneous. But do not surrender your honest conviction as to the weight or effect of evidence solely because of your opinion of the opinion of your fellow jurors, or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. You are not partisans, you are judges and judges of the facts. You may return on each crime charge a verdict of either guilty or not guilty. Your verdict, whatever it may be, as each crime charge, must be unanimous. Each of the 12 members of the deliberating jury must agree as to the verdict. Now, to assist you, um, I'm going to pass this out to this, uh, well, you'll, you'll see it. To assist you in reporting a verdict, I've prepared a verdict sheet for you. You can have that with you in the jury room. The verdict sheet is not evidence. This form is only uh, to be used to report your verdict. And essentially lists the first count of the indictment. We'll have, with respect to the charge, how they find the defendant not guilty or guilty. And then on the second count, it says contempt, violation of the order uh, under the provision of the Domestic Violence Act and the language of the indictment. With respect to that charge, how do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? Um, and then you heard that lesser included language of the charge, and again, you'll have the charge with you to review. With respect to the charge, how do you find the defendant not guilty or guilty? Um, if, you define, if you find the defendant not guilty on the second count, then there's this uh, lesser included offense um, that you can address if you find if, uh, the defendant not guilty on the second count. You can consider the lesser included account, on the account um, which is contempt, violation of an order under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act. And it spells out uh, the language there. With respect to that charge, how do you find the defendant uh, not guilty? So you'll have a copy of the very cheap, and um, it's fairly self-explanatory. If you have questions about it, of course you can, you can raise them. Finally, if during your deliberations you have a question, or you feel that you need further assistance or instructions from me, or wish to have certain testimony read or played back, uh, or video or audio exhibits you want to be happy to have, um, write your question or your request on a sheet of paper, Give it to the sheriff's officer or attendant who will be attending to you. They'll be standing at the jury room, who in turn will give it to me. That officer will be sworn to perform certain duties, such as keeping the jury together in, in a private place for purposes of deliberations and ensuring that no one speaks with you except by order of the court. You are not to discuss with or ask the officer about trial matters or procedures. Please be aware that the officer is also instructed not to initiate communications with you or to enter the deliberation room without your consent, except to communicate on my, on my behalf regarding administrative matters, such as information about breaks or meals, I don't think it will be meals brought to you, um, or otherwise to ensure your comfort. If the officer must enter the deliberation room, the officer will knock first and complete the officer's responsibilities without delay. When the officer enters the room, Please stop your deliberations and do not resume until the officer has left and closed the door. Once I receive your question or request, if that comes about, I will go over it with the lawyers and will try to answer it as quickly as possible. Please be patient. Sometimes, depending on the nature of the question, it might entail a little bit of research to, to find the right answer for you. If you, do, if you do send out a question, please do not disclose where you stand in your deliberations. Don't tell us, for example, if you're 10 to 2, or 6 to 6, or 8 to 4, or anything like that, on a given charge. We don't want to know, you know what, what numbers exist, if any. If you've reached a unanimous verdict on each charge, please knock on the door, let the officer know that, and we'll bring you into the court as soon as possible to receive your verdict. That is the end of the charge. Uh, we're going to have copies for you. I will leave it to your discretion if you want to go in for 20 minutes and break for lunch. We'd rather take your lunch now. Come back at uh, 1.30 and start that. Totally if you want to take a, a hand raised voice vote or 